Welcome to Grace River Church Online at Home. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us here today. My prayer is, is that you're able to take a next step in your spiritual walk with God. Yeah, and if this is your first time, we want to encourage you to text the word first to the number on the screen just so we can say thanks for stopping by. Yeah, let's, let's dive into worship here today. I'm excited for this. This is going to be great. Let's dive in. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris Seifel. I'm lead pastor at, here at Grace River Church. I want to say thank you so much for watching Church Online at Home. A couple quick things before we jump into our talk today. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called The Good News, and so, uh, man, I'm really pumped to talk about this, and I really believe there's a next step for you to take on your spiritual journey as a result of this talk. And so, uh, we've got a big Easter egg event coming up uh, Saturday, April 9th from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. I want you to know you and your family are welcome to attend this. Uh, if you've got younger kids, this would be great. Now, we've already sold out of this event. Uh, and so it's crazy. We've got almost 3,000 kids registered for this event right now, just, just kids. It's going to be absolutely crazy. And so if you're looking for a fun Easter egg hunt uh, for your family, a big memory maker, this is it for you. Uh, you can just show up the day of the event and tell them Chris sent you, and they'll, they'll find a spot for you. And so uh, also, if you're looking for something to do as a volunteer, we need volunteers for this event. You can sign up to volunteer on our website at graceriver.cc forward slash volunteer. Uh, egg drop volunteer. It's going to be a great event. You will not want to miss it. And then one big thing I want to mention before we jump into our talk today is Easter weekend at Grace River Church is going to be absolutely amazing. And so we have five Easter services uh, starting uh, April 15th, Friday, April 15th at six o'clock, Saturday, April 16th at 4.30. And then uh, our normal Sunday morning service times, April 17th at 8.30, 9.45 and 11 o'clock. I want you to know there is something for every age at Grace River Church on Easter Sunday. Your kids will love it. Uh, your parents will love it. Uh, your, your friends will love it. Your neighbors will love it. Your coworkers will love it. And so uh, my threefold pastor promise to you, if you invite a friend to Easter, is they're going to have a good time. Uh, they're going to hear the good news and they're going to get a chance to respond to it. And so uh, this is going to be a fun Easter here at Grace River Church. And there's literally something for everyone. And so you want to make sure to make it out to one of our five Easter service times on Easter weekend. And so uh, we, like I mentioned, are in the middle of a series right now called The Good News. Uh, and the answer really is Easter. So this is a, a sermon series that we're doing leading up to Easter. And today we're going to be talking about the God of second chances. And so we're actually telling the story of Matthew, the tax collector, and how uh, Matthew, the disciple, he would go on to write uh, the first gospel in the Bible, the first book of the New Testament, uh, the gospel of Matthew, uh, is written by a guy that Jesus called to follow him, and his name was Matthew. And so, uh, but before we jump into uh, more about Matthew, because we're going to do a little bit of a character study on him, hear more about his life and how his life and our lives aren't all that much different, and how Jesus loved him and how Jesus loves us, it's very similar. But there's two questions I want to ask you uh, before we jump into this talk. And the, the first question is this, is what do you think that God thinks of you? Like when you think, what does God think of me? Do you think that God thinks uh, that you're a failure? Do you think that God thinks uh, that you're a mistake? Do you think that God thinks that you've blown it? Or do you know that God loves you, that he's crazy about you, that he is willing to give you a second, a third, a fourth, a one millionth chance? Um, so, And then the second question I want to ask you is, does God only think of your past or does he also think of what you could be? Like when God looks at you, does he only think about the baggage from your past or does he also look at you and go, no, there's more to her. There's more to him. There's more to this story than what everyone else sees. And so you may be labeled as something because of your past, but I want you to know when it comes to God, God doesn't just see your past. He also sees your future. He also knows that you're meant for more. And so that's why he sent his only son, Jesus, to come and hit the delete button on every one of our sins because God knew there was more to the story. And so how you answer those two questions will impact how you see three things. How you see yourself, like, man, how I answer the question, does God love me? How I answer the question, does God only think about my past or does he also think about my present and my future? It will impact how you view yourself. Uh, it will also impact, obviously, how you view God. Like your viewpoint on who God is is, is really altered by answering those two questions. And then it also helps us to understand the world around us better. Like, man, what, how is the world framed up around me? And is the world really all about me? Is my life rotating around me or is it about God? And the answer today is it's not about us, it's about God. And so let's jump into this talk today, uh, the story of Matthew. And I want you to kind of 
understand three quick things about Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish man. Uh, he was also a tax collector, and he was an employee of the Roman government. So this makes his life kind of complicated. I'm going to explain more why his life is complicated. First of all, uh, he's a Jewish man, and so uh, he's a Jewish man living uh, in a Roman-occupied city. And so he's Jewish, uh, living in a Roman-occupied city, and Jews in this city had to pay taxes to the Roman government, and they would hire uh, Jewish people to collect taxes from their own people. And so you can imagine uh, this wasn't a favorable job or a favorable position. In fact, tax collectors were often loners. They often did not have friends because they were known as people that would steal money from their own people. Because essentially what Matthew's job was, was Matthew was over a certain territory and he was supposed to collect a certain amount of money from this territory. And anything above and beyond that, he could keep for himself. And so uh, they, he would often make shady deals. He would often overcharge people for their taxes. And all he had was personal gain as a result. And so, uh, and so he was, as an employee of the Roman government, again, he wasn't looked upon favorably. And so you got to think to yourself, why would you pick this career path? I mean, you think about like, Man, you think of all the things that Matthew could have been, right? He could have been a tradesman. He could have been a fisherman, right? Uh, he, he could have done a lot of different things with his life. So why does he choose being a tax collector? Because we know uh, this is not a favorable job. And so uh, it's one of three things or all three things. Really, he would have chose this career path uh, for a love of money. There had to be something inside of him that thought, if I just could attain more money, then my life would be easier. Maybe it was a hardened heart. Maybe it's just the fact that he just simply had a bad, hard heart. Or maybe it was some level of hopelessness going, man, there's nothing else I can do but this. So a little bit more about tax collectors, okay? So they're not welcome in the synagogue, and so you couldn't go to church. Can you imagine that? Like, you're not allowed in your faith traditions worship services. Like, their version of church 2,000 years ago as a Jewish man he would have been going to synagogue, but he's unable to attend. I mean, can you imagine that? Not being allowed inside of a church. Also, he would have been told that his prayers were not listened to. And so if he chose to pray, he was told in his faith tradition that God would not hear his prayers. Also, that he would never receive mercy from God. That he would never be forgiven of his sins. That really, there, there, his life is a case-closed situation. That, that there is no chance of redemption for him. No chance that he will not be redeemed. He will not be saved from his sins. And here's the good news. Those were all actually lies. And Jesus came to change all of this. And that's why we're talking today about the God of second chances. Because you may have felt like this at one time in your life, or even right now you feel like this. And that may be why you're watching church online and not here in person, because you feel like you're not going to be accepted. And I want you to know this, man. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God is crazy about the real you. So religion says this, I got to clean myself up on the outside so God will accept me on the inside. And what I want you to know is this, is that God is ready to love you right now, just the way that you are. And so we're going to talk today about Jesus and really four truths about Jesus. Jesus always sees me as I am. So Jesus sees you as you are. And so uh, in Matthew chapter 9, this is where the story begins to unfold. Uh, in Matthew 9, verse 9, it says this, as Jesus was walking along. Now, Jesus was walking, if you uh, look in the Bible, in the first part of Matthew chapter 9, he had just got done healing a paralyzed man, uh, a man that was not able to walk. His four friends tore the roof off a house and lowered him to the feet of Jesus. And so that's the miracle that Jesus had just gotten done performing. He's assembling his dream team of disciples. Uh, and so far, it's just fishermen, right? And so uh, we covered that last week, him calling some of the first disciples. Um, and so we see this, that he saw a man named Matthew at his tax collector's booth. So here's Matthew at, at the tax collector booth. He walks by him, and here's what he says to him. He says, follow me and be my disciple. Now again, Jesus is Jewish. Matthew's Jewish. Most of the disciples that are following him are Jewish, and they all understand who Matthew is. They all understand that he's a tax collector 
that they should not be friends with, that here is this God-man Jesus breaking literally all the rules by inviting Matthew to be his disciple. He says, follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up and followed him. Just like that, Matthew gets up and follows him. But what I want you to see uh, is this first part of this passage. He saw a man named Matthew. Jesus saw Matthew as he was. Now, this wasn't just a glance that he saw Matthew. When he saw Matthew, he understood who Matthew was. He understood Matthew's past, he understood Matthew's present, and he understood Matthew's future and the the capacity of what Matthew could be able to do if someone just simply loved and believed in him. And that's what Jesus did. And I want you to know today that Jesus sees you just as you are. He knows you. There's nothing that you can hide from him. He sees you and he notices you. He knows about your pain. He knows about your past. He knows about your hurts. He knows about your habits. He knows about your hangups. He knows about all of this stuff in your life. I want you to know you are not forgotten by Jesus. He sees you right where you're at. In fact, I want you to watch a clip from The Chosen right now. It's a quick little three-minute clip of this event actually happening. And I love The Chosen. They do such a great job helping us to explain this story in a visual way. So watch this quick clip. Uh, And I'll be right back in just a second to help uh, teach the rest of this talk. Thank you. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Man, I just love that clip. And uh, it's such a powerful moment to see Peter talking to Jesus about Matthew and him, him saying, but you don't know what he's done, right? And you can just see the love that Jesus has for Matthew. I absolutely love it because that is our story, that There are other religious people in our past that would go, man, there's no way God could forgive you. And here's what I want you to know is the truth is, is that there's nothing you could ever do to make God not love you. And so uh, Jesus loves me just, uh, he sees me as I am. That's the first thing. But he also loves me as I am. 
That's what I love about the story is that we get to see this kind of unfold, and I hope that you enjoyed that clip. But we get to see this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 11. The story continues on. Later, Matthew invited his disciples to his home as dinner guests. So here we are now. Matthew is the in, inviting Jesus over to his house. In fact, the first place that Jesus leads Matthew to is his own home. He says, follow me, be my disciple. And I love that moment in the, in the chosen clip at the end there where, where Matthew goes, oh, well, I'm not invited to parties. And Jesus says, oh, it's okay. Uh, we're coming to your house. I mean, how unbelievable is that? That's what I love about the good news. It's not about what you can achieve. It's about believing and receiving. Matthew could have never done anything to dig himself out of the hole that he was in. It was Jesus that came to his life. That's the good news. And that's what you need to understand. The good news, uh, we don't deserve that. Matthew did not deserve a second chance, but he got one anyways. And what's incredible about Matthew's story is at the first chance that he got, he took the second chance. And I want you to know that's the story of us today, is that our very first chance that we got, man, and it may be just right now for you as you're hearing this talk, man, take the first chance you have at your second chance. And so uh, he goes on to be guest along with many tax collectors and other uh, disruptable sinners. Uh, other versions of the Bible say other notorious sinners. So it's interesting because the friends that Matthew had would have been other sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, drug dealers. These people would not have been really great people to be around. And Jesus says, invite all your friends to this party. And that's the kind of people that Jesus wanted to get to know. Jesus loved Matthew and his friends just as they were, not how they should have been. And I want you to know that's the way that Jesus loves us. We go on to read. But when the Pharisees, who were a religious group of people, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum. You see, to have a meal with somebody during this time period meant something. It meant that you were friends. It meant that you accepted them. Maybe you didn't accept their lifestyle, but you accepted them as people. In fact, uh, Jewish tradition during this time period, spending time with a tax collector at dinner would have been like eating a meal with a pig. And that's pretty dramatic to think about, but like as a Jewish person, they didn't even eat pigs, right? And so uh, they wouldn't eat pork products. And so to spend time, uh, this word scum is actually a little elevated from what this really should have been. But here's the really cool thing is Jesus loved Matthew and his friends as they were, not, ha not how they should have been. And that's the incredible, scandalous grace that we get to experience with God is that even though we don't deserve Jesus, we still get him anyways. Jesus is always loving us just as we are. Jesus also calls me as I am, which is really crazy. And so Jesus had a, a higher purpose for Matthew. And I want you to know, that's all, and also a transferable truth in your life. But you know this, that Jesus actually has a higher purpose, a higher calling for your life than you can ever imagine. And so here's what happens when Jesus hears these religious people talking trash. Uh, and he kind of puts them in their place. That's what I love about Jesus uh, is that he's able to put them right where they needed to be uh, and to put, their, put these religious people in check. Let's look at this in verses 12 through 13. When Jesus heard this, he said this, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I mean, you know this, right? We go to the doctor uh, because we're sick. That's why we go, right? And he's just explaining that healthy people People that have it all together don't need a doctor. It's sick people. So he's like, he's combating them and saying, listen, I, I've come for sick people. Then he added, now go and learn what this means, this meaning of this scripture. I want to show you mercy, not, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus did not come for the people that have their act all together. He came for sinners, And he tells them to go and learn what this means because they were so used to offering sacrifices. They were so used to these public displays of being religious people. Again, that's cleaning yourself up on the outside and pretending like everything's good on the inside. These Pharisees were really focused on the outside of their cup being clean, but the inside of their cup was absolutely filthy and dirty. And so Jesus says, go and learn what this means. He wants them to know, I'm not interested in all your sacrifices. I'm interested in you. So Jesus calls 
us as we are. And so that's an, a really important thing for us all to recognize and to notice that he calls us like we are now. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 4, that when he says, go and learn what this means, he's actually quoting this passage from the Old Testament that they would have been very familiar with. You know, this would have been like the, him quoting a line from a movie that they would have known. He says, Israel and Judah, what should I do with you? Asked the Lord. For your love vanishes like the morning mist. It disappears like the dew in the sunlight. He's explaining to them that your sacrifices are only a temporary love. It's, it's conditional, which is it's like the morning dew that vanishes away when the sun rises. And so Jesus calls us as we are. He's not interested in our sacrifices. He's interested in this concept of mercy. And mercy is, is me recognizing that I don't deserve God, but I get him anyways. And so I want to offer mercy to others as well. That there's not levels of, of, of spirituality where I'm better than somebody else. We're all at the foot of the cross here. In fact, the, the, the field is very level at the foot of the cross. There's nothing that makes any of us more spiritual than the rest. We all are in the same boat. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And so Jesus calls Matthew and his friends and the rest of us as disciples as we are. And so, but here's the thing, Jesus will never leave, a, leave me as I am. That's the powerful thing about the truth of Jesus is Matthew's life is drastically changed. I want you to understand this, that Jesus will never leave you as you are. Now there's this beautiful moment that happens when we recognize what happened on the cross for our sins. And that's a big word known as justification. We're justified. Like when we recognize that it was Jesus' life in exchange for my life, it's this awesome moment that happens when I recognize that, man, the good news is not about achievement. Maybe you grew up in a religious background and you thought, man, I had to get baptized or go to this class or, or give money or volunteer or show up to a youth group or whatever it was to be made right with God. And what I want you to know is that has nothing to do with it. Uh, that the only way that you and I are made right with God is through what's been done for us. So it's not about achievement. It's about believing and receiving what's already happened for us. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 talks more about this in another passage in Ephesians that I'm going to share in a moment. But uh, here's what Paul says, the Apostle Paul, who at one point thought that it was religion that was going to save him. And so here's what Paul says in these two scriptures. He says, And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you. Now, who was it that started the good work? It wasn't us. Like we oftentimes, the longer you're a Christian, the, the more you begin to deceive yourself thinking that it was you that saved you. And what I want you to know, it wasn't about us, it was about him. You see, Paul says, I'm certain that he who began a good work within you will continue this work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. God is not done with you yet. He calls you as you are, loves you as you are, but he will never leave you the same way that he found you. And so that's, what the, that's the powerful thing here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 so this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. So what was it that saved us? It wasn't our own good works. God saved us by his grace when we did what? When we believed. You see, it wasn't about achieving. It was about believing and receiving what's already happened for us. And he says this, you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. What Paul is saying is there's nothing I or there's nothing you could ever do to achieve our salvation. Nothing. And religion gets that all mixed up because religion tells you that you have to do better and try harder. And here's Jesus coming in telling us this. No, it's not about what you've done. It's not even about that. It's about what I'm about to do for you. So in Matthew, and I told you earlier that everything changes for Matthew when Jesus calls him to be a disciple. He's not the same guy. He's not the same person. See, Matthew, whenever Jesus calls him, he left behind his guilt, his shame, his past, and all the things that he used to hate. That's what he left behind. And I wonder today, have you left that stuff behind? Like Jesus is inviting you to the same life that he was inviting Matthew to. He was calling Matthew to something greater, and he's calling you to something greater. And you just can't stay the same. So I want to close with the two questions that I asked you whenever we opened this message up. And the Remember those two questions? What does God think of you? Like when he looks at you, do you understand that he sees you, that he understands you, that he relates to you, that he's not mad at you? Like do you understand that if there's a fridge in heaven, your picture is on it, that he is crazy 
about you? What does God think of you? And the second question is, does God only think of your past? Or does he also think about, think of what you could be? And I just wonder today, man, are you ready to take your first chance at your second chance? Because man, the first chance that Matthew got, he took it at his second chance. And I wonder today, are you ready to take that second chance? Are you ready to say, man, I'm gonna go believe in this God of second chances, that it's not about what I can achieve, it's about believing and receiving what's already happened to me. I don't know how you can answer these two questions, but the way you answer them changes your view of yourself, it changes your view of God, it changes your view of the world around you. And so I wonder, how are you answering these questions as you listen to this? So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just wonder today, just in a moment, just for you to think about where you're at when it comes to these two questions. Do you understand that God is crazy about you, that he bankrupted heaven to be with you? to make things right with you, that you and I are not much different than Matthew at all. We've all got things in our past that we're not proud of. Guys, guys we, all, we all have things that we look back at and we think, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. We all have things in our life that we regret, that we have remorse over. And I wonder if it's today that you take your first chance at your second chance, that you say, man, I'm ready to believe and receive in this Savior that came and died for me. And if you're ready to do that, you could pray a prayer just like this. God, I recognize that I need a second chance. That there's nothing inside of me that's good. God, I got things in my life that, that I regret, that I have shame about, and I know those things are sin. And I know that sin keeps me from you. But God, today I believe that you sent your only son to come and die for all that junk in my life. And God, today I confess with my heart and with my life, you and only you, to be the Savior. God, I thank you. There's nothing I could have ever done to achieve my own salvation. But today I'm believing and receiving what you've done for me. Help me to live the rest of my life, not for me, but for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all of this. Amen. Man, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know you're believing in the God of second chances, uh, that Jesus came for you. And if you could just simply text the word yes to 636 636- 336-2475, that's the word yes, to 636-336-2475. Uh, I would love to be able to get some resources in your hands to help you take the next step on your spiritual journey. We won't spam you, bug you, nothing like that. We just want to celebrate with you as a church uh, and congratulate you on this big first step of many steps uh, of you making Jesus the Lord and leader of your life. And so I want to, again, invite you out to Easter at Grace River. Five service times, uh, April 15th, April 16th, April 17th. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Again, something for everybody and every one of these services. You're going to love it. I can't wait to see you at Easter at Grace River Church. I hope that you have an awesome rest of your week, and I can't wait to meet you in person uh, on Easter weekend. Thanks again.
Thank you so much again for joining us today. We hope that you can take a next step in your walk with Christ. Here at Grace River, we worship in three ways. Through singing, through the hearing of God's word, and through giving back to the God who's given us everything. If you'd like to give today, you can do so by texting Grace Server to the number on the screen. I also wanna personally invite you to one of our in-person services on a Sunday morning. We have service at 8.30, 9.45, and 11, and we have a seat saved just for you. So come check us out. We hope you have a great week.